Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with custom knife maker, designer, and machinist Princeton Wong. Prince Customs is a design, engineering, and fabrication company serving a broad client base that has turned some of its bandwidth to knife making and design. Princeton has won multiple Blade Show awards in the last few years, including trophies in both the custom and production categories. And his knives range from sleek and stout EDC folders uh, to complex and labored over art style knives. We'll meet Princeton and find out how his business has evolved to make some of the most celebrated contemporary knives. But first, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and download the show to your favorite podcast app so you can listen when you're done doing dishes. Uh, and also share the show with a friend. That's the best way to help the show. Another great way is to go uh, and uh, sign up right here for a Patreon thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon or scan the QR code. Again, that's thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Adventure Delivered, your monthly subscription for hand-picked outdoor, survival, EDC, and other cool gear from our expert team of outdoor professionals. Thenifejunkie.com slash BattleBox. Prince, welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me. It, it's a pleasure. Uh, uh, I'm going to call you Prince uh, because it's cool. You don't get to call too many people Prince. And, and you said I can call you that or Princeton. So, yeah. Uh, but it's a real pleasure to meet you. I had a chance to meet you very briefly at the end mm -hmm. of Blade Show uh, this yeah. year and got a chance to check out some of the work on the table, including that fial we were just talking about. But I want to mm -hmm. I want to congratulate you on all your uh, success. Uh, yeah. Recent Thank success. you so much. Yeah. It's been a. Uh... Pretty surprising to be honest yeah just kind of putting myself out there and seeing everyone kind of accepting it, it's been amazing for sure well your first award we'll, we'll talk about your awards up front sure. your first award was uh blade show 2021 what was that uh that one was the uh, most innovative design so i guess the custom version of the fial the the fion we changed the name because of uh some copyright like trademark issues, but, um, uh, yeah. So back in, uh, are we, are we talking about blade show in Atlanta or yeah, I was, talking, Texas? I, I was talking about your very first award. I think it was blade show 2021 in Atlanta. Okay. Yeah. So that one was, uh, best new maker at blade show, but also for this knife design Oh, and, okay. uh, a, a much fancier one. Yep. It had like zirconium and, Damascus and all that kind of jazz on it. But, oh, okay, let's yeah. talk about this. We were, we were talking right before we rolled about this uh, particular design. Start started as a custom <laughs> and turned into uh, a design with CRKT, the Fial. Sure. Uh, yeah. Tell it. Tell us all about this knife. This one you first uh, most innovative, uh, best new knife maker, and now yeah. another award uh, three years later in its yeah uh, for the production of... version. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. So yeah, I mean the. Uh, idea started with a good family friend. He came into the shop one day. He's like, I have this idea. I want to run by you. And he dropped a CRK Sabenza and his wine key. And he asked me, is there any way you can combine these so I can just carry one tool with me? And, uh, you know, I love wine. So yeah, I took on the challenge and the result was the, the film. So Which what I'm cute. seeing here is a regular mm -hmm. modern front flipping knife. I don't get yep. it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm being so, cool. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it's a front flipper, as you said, right? And um, but hidden in the bolster, that split is actually like a functional lever as well as the corkscrew. To, so you would flip it over. You know, you have access to getting the cork and then leverage on the actual bottle to pull the cork. But yeah, the whole idea was to have the side profile of a, you know, an elegant like carry knife without, you know, the corkscrew just screaming at you. Because typically you see knives, they have a big cutout and the corkscrew is just 
in, on display from the get-go. But I wanted to try to avoid that if possible. And yeah, it was quite a, a packaging challenge, but it worked out in the end. Well, in doing so, uh, you also made, well, uh, you made a, a knife that really looks great. looks like a regular knife until you open yeah, it you. up, uh, but mm -hmm. also super functional. I mean, uh, we've all opened bottles of wine on French trains late at night or where, wherever <laughs> uh, with, a, with a Swiss Army knife. And it's like this and then boom, and then yeah. you elbow your girlfriend. And then, you know, we've all done that. Spill wine everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but but to have the lever and the wine, you yeah. know, that's that's how, uh, you know, that's how a real aficionado would would. M might open a bottle uh sure <laughs> easily or or if you're a waiter or anything like that bartender yeah. that'd be a super mm -hmm. flex to pull that knife out uh, uh so what were some of the engineering challenges of making that design um so mainly the packaging of it like getting it all to fit into a relatively slim profile while still like maintaining a, a decent like blade to handle ratio and people not realizing there's like decent sized corkscrew like filling up like a good portion of that area here so aside from that um i had to work out the geometry quite a bit to get the lever to function well enough with the the length of the screw so you don't actually need a secondary step which a lot of people are looking for when they see this knife but it pulls what you, the what cork out enough about there you talk about yeah. the hinge on the on the lever yeah, some of them have a hinge or some of them will have like another step so that you like start it and then you change over to the second step to pull it the rest of the way out. But that would have ruined the aesthetic of it being a normal knife. You would see another step. I wanted to keep it so that it just looked like a, bol a bolster detail, like in the front. And uh, yeah, there's some other funny things like there's a little thumb stud so you can access the screw. And if you notice here, there's actually a cutout in the liner. Oh yeah, yeah, I can see Yeah, that. that's actually a spring for the screw, so it's not just flopping around, like while it's in your pocket and rattling, but it also kind of holds it up in that position when you're, you know, getting the screw into the cork. So do you still make this as a custom? Or the uh, what's uh, the custom name? Fion. Yeah, the Fion. Yep, I still do. Yep. So, uh, mm -hmm. is the corkscrew a real pain in the butt to make? I mean, to me, like I look, I see the whole thing, and it all looks like, uh, you know, uh, more complicated or complex than your usual folder, but sure. all kind of within like uh, engineering that most knife makers are probably <laughs> familiar with. But that damn corkscrew. What about that? Yeah, so I studied corkscrews for quite a bit, you know, trying to get the right, you know, the ratio of like how many turns for the length. And I was making a, a higher end knife, so I didn't want to just buy a cheap corkscrew and just kind of like weld pieces to it to get it to work. So on the custom, this was before I had my, my lathe as well. So you can see that, yeah, it's all fully machined, but it, it was machined on a three axis mill. So it's like seven operations to, wow. to machine the thing. And uh, yeah, I just used what I had to make it work. That's, that's pretty amazing. All right. All right. All right. Let's, let's let we, we, do, we dove right into the Fial. I love that knife. I think it's, uh, you know, won the innovation fest, uh, innovative, uh, knife in 20, yeah, most innovative in, uh, Blade Texas before it was ICCE like that year that Blade Show kind of took it over for the first oh, time. Right, yep. right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but it takes a lot of engineering prowess, a lot of design prowess, and ability with machines to do stuff like this. Uh, sure. You you know how to build things. Where does that come from? You have a company, Prince Customs, and you don't just make knives. Yeah. Tell tell me about your company. Yeah. So. I started the company with the idea of uh, I love like just building things and learning about fabrication in general. Um, the idea was to offer fabrication services to people that had nowhere else to turn. So if it was like some weird project, maybe they would come to my shop and, you know, could get it done. Um, but my 
background in fabrication really started in the automotive industry. Hmm. Yeah, so you're pulling it up there. Yeah, so back in the day, I was hanging out at a friend's automotive tuning shop. They were do doing like turbo civics and NSXs and stuff like that. Oh, and uh, yeah, one of the, the first car that I built was a twin turbo 911. Oh, and uh, <laughs> nice. Uh, uh, sorry, I just have to interject. Uh, yeah, sure. uh, my my father had a few 911s when I was a kid, okay. and we always loved them. They're the my I think yeah, they're, they're cars. wild cars. Definitely yeah. a trip to drive. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So anyway. He, yeah, so that was the first car I decided to tear into. Uh, probably ripped like four or 500 pounds out of it and built a whole twin turbo system. Like, wow. it, was, it was a fun car. <laughs> I still have it today. But Oh, nice. Yeah, that's probably not the normal first car to rip up, you know. <laughs> So did, were you, did you grow up uh, doing mechanical things, uh, working on cars and all that kind of stuff? Or uh, Not at all. Yeah. So my dad, he was a research professor, you know, in the sciences. Mm -hmm. um, always liked tinkering and building stuff, you know, with my hands. But I didn't really get into the fabrication side until college. Um, I decided I was going to study mechanical engineering. And uh, I ran into some friends who were at the shop and got introduced to the automotive tuning fabrication, like welding and, you know, a little bit of machining, but mostly uh, like hand fabrication with band saws and sanders and things like that. And that kind of just sparked the interest and it just grew from there. Um, eventually I ended up graduating with a graphic communication degree, like graphic design. So I did a uh, graphics design in like print, web, all sorts of stuff. And then eventually environmental design, which tied in a bit of the fabrication understanding um, alongside the design side. So what's environmental design? Yeah, so the job that I was doing, we would go in and these big companies like uh, Masco or uh, Eli Lilly would hire the architecture firm that I was working with and they would ask us to like redesign I guess their entryway to kind of tell their story or there are some airports that we worked with and we design all the signage and the you know all the structures behind it so it's a mix of that design background but also we'd be directing like oh this is you know the structure that we need behind all of this and this is my how we might fabricate it so it was a fun mix of the two, I think. So eventually you start your own company, Prince Customs, where you yeah. engineer engineer and uh, design and build and fabricate stuff uh, for different companies. I saw your client list. It's a pretty, pretty, seems like a pretty broad base of people that, uh, that you <laughs> yeah, work with. It's all over the place. <laughs> I mean, what, uh, like, what kind of stuff? Are you making parts for machines and airplanes and that kind of thing? Or Because I saw um, Boeing. <laughs> so. Oh, yeah, Boeing. That was uh, from my design background. Hmm. actually did this really early like iPad app where they were trying to promote the capabilities and the, I guess, how do you say it? I guess the adaptability of like the F-16s to try to hmm. extend their service life. Right. And uh, I was behind the design of that application that they presented, you know, to the government and stuff like that. But uh, on the fabrication side, that was more automotive and uh, architectural. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So That's where I started how, did, how did it happen? Okay. You, you have all of these machines. I mean, I was looking at your, mm -hmm. uh, your website, you laser engrave, you CNC, you do CAD cam, yep. uh, all sorts of, and, and even other uh, sort of more, more traditional modes of fabrication. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so how did you get into actually making knives? I mean, are you, have you always been a knife lover, a, a, a carrier? Yeah. Lover? So yeah, I grew up taking martial arts my entire life. I've always been exposed to like swords and, you know, bladed weapons. So I've always loved that kind of stuff. And what kid doesn't love like ninjas and, you know, Japanese forging as they grow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, that's always been a passion. And when I started my own shop, I kind of had the choice, do I just buy equipment that would, you know, get me by in the architectural field or do I buy stuff that I could do 
like machining of metals with so that I could eventually like make knives and things like that. So when I started it with the idea that I would eventually like get into my own passions as well. So knives were always your passion. You knew you were going to head there, but you had practical experience fabricating stuff for other industries. Yeah, completely different <laughs> industries, but yeah. Well, okay. So what was the first knife you made? Folder or? Fixed it was a folder. folder. Yeah. You so that was in. Folder. Just straight to folder. <laughs> straight to folder. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, obviously you can tell I'm like really big into mechanisms and the mechanics of stuff. So yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I had to go straight to Boulder. I had been kind of dreaming it up. Um, my wife and I lived in Japan for two years, and I'd been, you know, sketching stuff, thinking about it. And not long after we moved back, I had signed up for a blade show in 2018. And uh, yeah, so the the first night I brought to blade show in 2018, I I realized two months ahead of blade show that. I only had sketches and um, <laughs> yeah, I, I needed to order a kiln and, you know, actually start making stuff. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so that first knife was the Daruma. Ooh. Oh, and okay. I, yeah. So obviously Sorry. it's the, like Japanese inspiration. The Daruma character or himself is used for uh, setting goals. So you would like color in one eye when you set your goal. And then when you achieve it, you color in the other one. Oh, cool. Is and, that like a thing for kids in Japan or is that uh, more uh, for of for kids, like adults, uh, all okay. sorts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You would take it to like the temple or shrine, you know, when you reach the goal and like, I think toss it into like a fire or something like that. But yeah, so the goal was to get into making knives and uh, that's why I named it that. But yeah, so it was this knife. Ooh, that is okay. That is beautiful. Wow. So it's kind of on the more wild side for, you know, a first attempt at something. <laughs> yeah, I'll say. Well, it's got a very uh, unusual, it's got a very unusual design. And I'm not even talking about the, uh, the flourishes, which we'll get to in a second, but the overall, uh, well, you yeah. said you were into martial arts and, and uh, so, you know, that, that downward angled blade. Yeah, it kind of has like that Persian type, you know, the blade is curved down. So it's always kind of presented. Yes. You know, yeah. it's accessible. It has the, like the a full guard. Um, a lot of people were saying, oh, it's so curved. Like, is that going to be comfortable until they picked it up? And like, wow, it really fits into your hand. And it was a bit extended and like reinforced in the, back there you know as a blunt weapon but yeah so yeah. Uh, uh, hold that up a little bit closer to the camera let's look at that pivot area there's a lot of engraving or um milling and engraving on this right yeah so just going with the the japanese uh inspirations if i can get to focus oh, correct. there we go yeah yeah so if you're into you know japanese swords the katanas like the suba area, some of them have like a pure suba. Mm -hmm. So I was kind of trying to mimic that look on the bolster. And a lot of these shapes are based on like wing geometries. So I used a, a crane, like a Japanese crane yeah. motif. And then and, uh, as you go, as you go back, there's some sculpted wood. Is that wood? I'm seeing. Uh, no. So this is uh, it's a skeletonized backspacer. I'm sorry. I'm talking about the the brown part of the handle. Is that? Oh, this right here. Yeah. Uh, that's actually a DLC coated titanium. Oh my god, that's all. Yeah, the color is a bit off. Yeah. Uh, oh no, I I think it's just uh, more um, uh, <laughs> like more lux than I even knew. It, it's really beautiful. <laughs> this thing is really yeah. something. So, do you make multiples of these, or have you? Um, made I made about fifty of them. Okay. I guess. Yep. A little bit over 50. Um, this was before I really knew, or I, I wouldn't say I really know what I'm doing now, like knife fixture wise machining. But uh, this was like my first attempt at like fixturing these types of parts, like really thin metal and, 
and making a knife. So, uh, yeah, I showed up to Blade Show with 12 of these, which was a little bit nuts considering I like just started making knives. Yeah. But it, yeah, it worked out. It caught the attention of quite a few people. Um, that following, I guess, winter, it actually appeared in Blade Magazine as like, you know, the very end, they have cool knives or whatever. Yeah. But yeah. So I was pretty surprised by that. So did you sell all 12 that you went to Blade Show with that year? Uh, no, I sold a few of them, which I, I heard is a pretty good thing for the first show that you ever go to. <laughs> yeah, well, especially especially as an unknown quantity and doing yeah. something that is uh, very particular, you know, mm -hmm. it doesn't look like much else. You know? Yeah, exactly. It's yeah. a pretty unique design that I was just kind of throwing out there. It's like, oh, maybe people will like it, maybe they won't, but that's what so I like, so. Yep. So what what went into the design of that? And what are actually more than that? What did you learn? Like I, you're holding that knife. That's your first knife, or uh, yeah, that that was actually the very first frame I machined. The very first one. one. So you're holding yeah. it in your hand. I'm, you've made a lot of knives since. Uh, yeah. What are your impressions of your first knife now? Um. So I learned a lot about the, I guess the opinions of the community like certain things that they're looking for. I got a lot of feedback there. Um, this specific knife, I made the blade length like under three inches because I used to live in New York for a while. Mm -hmm. um, didn't want to, you know, have a knife that was a longer blade, you know, just to be on the safe side. Yeah. Um, but overall, like people would come and tell me their preferences on, you know, the ratios. Some people didn't like the... Uh, the flipper tab being so pronounced um like where it was placed like the geometry could be higher you get a different feel and the way the uh the pocket clip was made i was trying something different because the uh inlays here are raised the pocket clip actually doesn't touch the scale it interferes uh -huh. with your pocket because of the uh the raised inlay so it, it functions a little bit differently but still works so uh did, do you did you find that i mean kind of stepping into a new world uh with a product um that people are very used to in that world assessing did you find that sure. people were uh finicky more than expected or uh, very particular more than expected um not necessarily i mean it's i never spoken to anyone in the field so i just came in with an open mind and you know, I could, uh, they were gracious with like with their opinions. Nobody was just in my face about stuff. So, I mean, nothing really bad to say if they're just trying to give me constructive feedback. So, right, right. I, I guess okay. I guess I say finicky, and that mm -hmm. that sounds negative. I guess I mean particular because until you dive into any enthusiast mm -hmm. group, you don't know how deep it goes. And, oh you know, yeah, for sure. <laughs> and it goes deep here. I'm sure in cars it goes. Uh, you know, there's so yeah. much more to a car. I'm, I'm sure it goes uh, infinitely deeper. But, um, you know, so would you say that a lot of what you're doing now has been informed by by the kind of feedback you've gotten by knife aficionados, etc.? Sure. Yeah. So I do tie in like some of the the feedback that I've gotten or the I guess their perspectives. I still try to kind of inform my design aesthetic more on like oh do i like this or not versus what the the general like knife going like buying public likes um but of course i mean being around a lot of knives like you get you know influences from the community as well so yeah well uh how, how do you design how do you approach design um, so I'll just pull inspiration from like pop culture or nature, things like that. Um, pretty similarly to a lot of like car or automotive designers, you know, you look around, you see something beautiful, you want to pull in some of that aesthetic and, uh, you just go from there. Um, I'll like the things like with the Fial, um, that's a little bit informed by who might be using it and also, you know, just the functionality, like 
dictates a bit of the overall form in the end as well. So, well, it's like uh, sometimes you go into a creative endeavor without mm -hmm. uh, many preconceived notions. You let the thing sure. talk to you. It turns into something you weren't expecting. Yep. Or in other cases like this, you have a problem to solve. How do I yeah. make a, like an awesome yeah. modern folder, but hide a <laughs> corkscrew for my one yeah. no friend? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, but I mean, so, I mean, one other knife that's like, uh, that speaks to that is the Nucleus. Oh, this thing is wild. So this is another uh, foreign produced CRKT. And by foreign produced, I mean Italian, right? They're, they're both made in Italy, um, right? Yeah, so this would be the Italian one. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so uh, what? tell us about this knife. So this was, the design language here was entirely informed by my love for uh, like Japanese mecha, like Gundam specifically. So you All see right. like- Ex Explain that to people. Yeah, so if you can see on my shirt, there's like a robot here. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of them would carry like huge weapons, like a big sword on their arm. Yeah. But a lot of the robots, they have really angular shapes and um, yeah, like the bolster here is kind of designed after the big pauldrons that some of them have. And uh, you'd see cutouts for like their engines and all that kind of stuff all that over the place. Is cool. Are we talking like kind of um, uh, like uh, kaiju kind of things? Like not kaiju. Um, yeah, like I guess the robots that would fight the kaiju. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, yeah, or when um, I was exactly. a kid, we had Shogun Warriors. There were these yeah. Japanese toys that were like supposed uh -huh. to be giants. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, so that's really cool. You can see that in the in the design of of this knife. It's so mechanical looking. Yeah. So this, so this is, is one of the the customs that I like. I used to make, and I made it uh, small so you could fit it in your like a third pocket. And I wanted this one to be like really fidget friendly, so it has the front flipper, the big cutout, so you can flick it, and also the flipper in the back that's awesome so is this a model that you still make also i mean so i guess this is confusing to me when you make a custom sure. knife and mm -hmm. then you kind of well and then you license that design to a crkt no. for instance yep. you're still are you still allowed to produce that knife sure yeah yeah you're allowed to produce like up to a agreed upon amount Okay. Which uh, I guess most custom makers probably couldn't even meet anyways. <laughs> I, I was going to say, it's probably yeah. very realistic if you're hand making them or making them. Sure, the sure. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Um, so you also have another knife that uh, is uh, the kind of knife that I would EDC for sure. And okay. uh, 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 I wrote it down here somewhere, but uh, it's the all titanium front Ooh. flipper, beautiful kind of clip point. Uh, the. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So this is something I started making this year. It's called the Protean. Protean. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. This is kind of my test into like really using my manufacturing capabilities and offering them as like drops like every week or two. Okay. Explain. So, yeah. I mean, compared to like a Daruma where there's like investment cast bolsters and, you know, a million parts and stuff like that. Right. Uh, the Protean was, how do I simplify production down to a level that I'm still happy, like making something, but also leverage, you know, the, the capabilities of my machine shop to uh, to produce them in a larger quantity and also for a more accessible price point. Um, so that that was the uh, the child of that of that mindset is this knife. Move that uh, if you will flip it around so we can see the show side and hold it closer uh, to the to the camera. Uh, something I noticed is that well, this is beautiful. I mean, uh, so this is a great blend of really like. Uh, cool and unique design that's incredibly useful and not weird, um, but also has a uniqueness to it because I know that you do all sorts of different treatments of the surface. Uh, sure. You have that yeah. sort of flexibility if you're doing drops and and doing however many knives. That exactly. So yeah. And this this specific knife was 
it has a big flat section like on the scale aside from like the contouring like on the top and the bottom mm -hmm. so that i can like create different machine textures or designs to differentiate models or you know the drops um and also this handle design was also made so that i can actually put different blade styles into it so i have like a warncliffe drawn and a tanto and it all fits into this particular handle shape while maintaining like the same like length ratios and stuff like that uh, it looks like a really comfortable handle and and uh, it's also nice looking but what that's a great idea you know mm -hmm. uh, not only from a maker's point of view and a business point of view of having something constant like the handle and then mm -hmm. you swap out blades for it. Sure. Uh, but also if, if it's the kind of knife that uh, myself as a collector just loves, I'm going to yep. want as much variation as possible. Not only yeah, exactly. getting the different runs with the different uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. patterns, but a different blade every time. I mean, how cool is that? <laughs> yeah. So one of the fun things I did, it's not this one, this one has like a sunburst kind of milling on it. But recently I went to the Maker Syndicate, which was in Indianapolis. And being a racing fan, I had to do a pattern that's like inspired by, you know, the Indy 500. So I had this pattern that had a bunch of NACA ducks in it. What are um, NACA ducks? So they're these, uh, they're kind of like triangular shaped ducks that optimize airflow into like a small opening. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, so you'll see them on like a Nissan GTR, or I guess most famously a Ferrari F40 has like okay. giant yeah, yeah. nuts on it. Yeah, right, right, right. Or the yeah. the old Lamborghini. Or the Lamborghini Kuntash. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. I love that. Um, yeah. So it, it starts out small and widens out, and it just forces exactly. there. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so, uh, um, how often how often do you uh, make drops of the Protean? How do, how does how does I've work? been trying to do every week if possible. Um, and, I just start, I started making drop? them in like uh, March, April ish. So I've been ramping up into, you know, producing them more regularly. But sorry, what were you saying? Uh, I'm sorry, I kept interrupting you. And I was saying, how many knives are usually in a drop? Is this something that people have a realistic chance of getting if they just keep their eye on your Instagram or? or yeah. Whatever? So, I mean, I've sold a good amount of them so far. I've been doing like anywhere between eight to 12 is the goal. Yeah. Re most recently I've been doing eight, like every week is what the goal is. But Yeah. And, and so do you have a, um, like a dedicated following at this point? Do you have people who uh, are always kind of, kind of coming after your work? Do you have collectors? Um, yeah. So there's always people reaching out to me and, especially with the protein and the drops, like it kind of plays into that drop culture and people are looking for these. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, but people still ask me about my other knives, like the Daruma, which is kind of retired now, or uh, I don't know if you've seen this. Oh, no, I no, I love it already though. I love that <laughs> blade. My gosh, that's gorgeous. Is that an yeah, automatic? So this was, this auto, yep. So this was my first foray into automatics. Um, it's in collaboration with Latama Cutlery. Um, do you know them, like Walt I, Latama? I, I, Walt I, Sorry. I, I feel like I followed. I, I feel like I recognize the name. Yeah, he's own. been importing Italian stilettos and automatics for okay. a super long time, and he used to have like a newsletter that talked specifically about automatics and. But uh, yeah, he had this mechanism that he was developing. And if you follow the awards, I think you would have seen the very first one that was done by Reese Whalen. Oh, okay. It won uh, Most Innovative. It was a like a giant version. It was much larger. But yeah, Walt had come to me and he was asking me, hey, can you do something with this like special mechanism that we have the IP for? and make it a carryable size at a pocket clip and stuff like that and produce some for us. So this was the result of that collaboration with uh, Latama Cutlery. And it's yes, just... it's a different mechanism. As you can see, the whole clip side actually slides downwards. Oh, cool. So it's like a scale release, but not the kind we're used to. 
Yeah, it's not the traditional where you like push it side to side, like on the bolster or at yeah. the bottom. Yeah. The whole clip side slides down so you can keep your whole grip on it. And uh, God, yeah, that's cool. That is cool. And that blade is just awesome. Uh, so is this something that people can get or is this uh, was this a kind of limited uh, production sort of? Yeah, so I'm still allowed to make uh, 24 a year as customs. And I think Walt is probably sold out of the ones that I produce for them, like like production or mid tech, whatever you want to call it. But um, yeah, they're still available to this. Yep. Well, maybe you can make um, for the Protean. You can make a Warren Cliff that looks like that one because that man, that blade, <laughs> uh, you nailed it with that blade. I, I want to go back to something you were mentioning. You mentioned the drop culture, and I've never heard that term, but yeah, that works perfectly. <laughs> And I'm, I'm, I am not that guy. I, uh, yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's something like, that I'm still trying to understand and study as well. So I'm always yeah. the guy who's like, Oh, I missed out on it. What, what? Like, uh, <laughs> you know, because I, I'm not there at the time or whatever, I'm just not paying that much attention. Sure. So do you think that, um, doing drops, uh, like it, it seems like a great way to keep people interested and, and, yeah. to, and to make it like, a um, a real coveted kind of item. And at the same time, maybe you're keeping yourself out of, uh, that sort of, um, uh, uh corner people paint themselves into with books. You know what I mean? When they're sure. first getting yeah. started. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so it definitely allows you the freedom of not being tied to the like lengthy interactions where you're like trying to spec out a custom, you do a drop of a specific type, and that's just how it comes, you know. So aside from how bringing up, you know, time in that way, it also kind of gamifies the, the acquisition of, like, said product. Yeah. Um, it creates excitement around the brand and stuff like that, which you can see in, you know, just streetwear and all that kind of stuff. It's done all over the place. Gamify, I like that. Yeah, definitely, <laughs> definitely does. Yeah, because you, you have to be there. You have to be the fastest one, or you have to win the lotto and stuff like that. So yeah, and yeah. it's also uh, when when later you're showing off your knife uh, when you're in the pit or somewhere where people. Yeah, it's like oh, I was able to get one. Yeah, no one care. They're like, oh, check this out. Yeah, it's a Prince custom. <laughs> so, what? No one gets those. Um, the the when you started making knives and and selling mm -hmm. them. Uh, were you trying to, did you have to fish around for a business model or did this sort of naturally fit into your regular business? Um, so I've never been good at writing or following business models. I just kind of jump into what I feel like doing. <laughs> uh -huh. And uh, fortunately, it's kind of worked out for the most part, except for in college, I opened up a bubble tea shop uh, <laughs> oh, that's cool. in, an yeah, in another town with a friend and that didn't work out for various reasons, but <laughs> you probably shouldn't open a, a shop in a different city while you're studying engineering. So. Yeah, probably <laughs> you don't want to divide your, uh, your energies sure. there, but yeah. it sounds like, uh, like you've got the entrepreneurial sp spirit, sure. uh, yeah. which yeah. Obvi obviously is necessary to mm -hmm. start a fabrication shop, but definitely yeah. necessary, um, to start a knife business. Like, in starting your knife business in particular, what have you noticed about uh, about the knife industry um, that's different? I felt that it was a lot more accepting and supportive overall mm -hmm. than, say, automotive, where it's really cutthroat. I mean, I had the opportunity to, you know, really get deep into that. But, I mean, I'd seen so many of my friends, like, start their shops and get burnt out because of the way they're treated in that industry or like how cutthroat it is with pricing and, you know, in various ways that I kind of went a different direction than just straight automotive. Um, yeah. I, I think the knife industry is a lot more friendly than most, I would say. Uh, I'm not surprised to hear you say that because uh, I mean, I, I know it's kind of a cliche at this point, but oh, the knife industry, it's awesome. But uh, really, I do hear a lot of stories about how uh, people share techniques and tricks and of the trade yep. and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, 
with with others uh how much of this are you doing so so you are known not no you're not known uh you won for best i saw you were on a podcast and i i forgive me i can't remember what it was called it was a knife podcast uh with a very cool uh, logo and they and they titled uh, your episode so mac daddy because you're the uh, yeah the good old blades podcast by good uh, old blades. Uh, Aaron, uh, yeah. machine assisted custom knife right mac yeah <laughs> okay so this is a relatively new um category yeah from past, blade uh, yeah, yeah in mm -hmm. in the past couple of years how much of it is uh machine assisted i mean i know the parts are cut out that way but i mean where where does the handwork begin so i guess that just depends on who's entering um, i mean for you in your in your knives yeah so at my shop i take stuff from you know the raw plate of uh, steel or titanium and I do all the water jetting. I have a water jet in-house, um, all the machining. like So I guess you would say that the handwork begins either if somebody specs like a hand ground blade or every knife has hand finishing to one extent or, not, or the other, mm -hmm. some more than others, of course. But um, yeah, it, it just depends. So in that particular category, I think the only requirement was that part of it is done by machine, but you also have the hand finishing like aspect as well. Because I know that, um, you know, obviously, you know, CAD and, and the, the mm -hmm. design software is it's your bread and butter uh, yeah. as, as well as the other stuff. But I, I know that you don't just like put in these very complex uh, uh, programs or designs and then the, I know the knife isn't just spat out of the machine. Um, oh. There's a lot of back and forth, right? Between milling a piece or making a piece on a CNC machine and then, and then prepping it for the next step. Yeah. I mean, to make a saleable product, there's definitely all the hand finishing that people are, are expecting. I mean, like you said, the industry might be kind of finicky in what it's looking for. So you, it's not as bad anymore as maybe like a few years ago, but there's more machine finishes that are accepted now than say even in 2018 where like people may not have been accepting of like a machine bevel or, you know, the, the handle having like machine lines on it and stuff like that. Oh, okay. So, I, I mean, I know all the traditional finishing from, you know, the fabrication styles that I delved in before. And uh, yeah, depending on the knife, it's it's applied on on the knives as well. So yeah, I this is oh, yeah. this is the model that won uh, the Mac category. It's called the Orochi. Orochi, this is beautiful. If you if you can't if you're just listening, it's a recurve Tonto. Uh, I, I would say return tanto clip point i don't know what it is but it's, it's, <laughs> it's another really, one of my weird creations <laughs> yeah, it's really beautiful and with damascus and actually i was going to bring this up with the um uh looking at the damascus uh on some of the um proteans uh, i saw yeah. pictures of uh, uh -huh. it, it's got a very uh cool juxtaposition uh if i can use that word uh, between sure. the sort of swirly organic uh patterns on the damascus mm -hmm. with the very you know mechanized handle sure i sure. just i love the way that looks and and you were talking about um how it's now way more accept not even acceptable but it's like desirable to see some of the milling you know the steps uh on the sure. blade or, or yeah. on the blade bevels or um or the I, handle i mean before you know people would want like a smoothed out handle but now there's this whole thing like oh it's micro milling yeah it's like a catchphrase now so <laughs> it's really I, like oh you didn't do as fine of a machine line so you, you know the past the step overs aren't as fine so you can actually see more of those steps <laughs> so we'll so, just call it micro yeah so let's, exactly. talk, let's talk about this can you can you hold that close up to the uh to the camera yep okay so titanium frame lock bolster is yep. that what i'm seeing so the as always i'm trying to do something different uh, you can see the bolster actually wraps all the way around the frame. Oh, yeah. 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 So it wraps around and it 
caps the whole pivot area. So you don't see the pivot screw and also on the lock side, it kind of hides the mechanics a bit. That's what it is. I was like, yes, right. I can't see. The yeah, pivot. so it's not really a frame lock. It's not a liner lock. It's not a, a bolster lock or whatever. <laughs> but yeah. So another one of my kind of diff crazy different things. So is this a is this a model that you are now making uh, on a regular basis? Uh, yeah, so I've been doing these as a uh, customs. Okay. Yeah. So you, do you work simultaneously on the customs as you do uh, on the Proteans, which are kind of more yeah. your production? Yeah. Okay. So the production, the Proteans are set up to run overnight and then like in the morning. And then that kind of leaves my day for finishing and also to work on like custom stuff or architectural products and, you know, automotive stuff. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Uh, stuff to put uh, meat on the table, so to speak. <laughs> the non knife. So, uh, out there, uh, who do you emulate in turn, or who would you like to emulate in terms of uh, knife design, and 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 also just in terms of company in general? Uh -huh. Um, I've always really admired like Ron Best, his design aesthetic. Um, the I guess the the protein you can kind of see some design aesthetic, you know, with the uh, the mm -hmm. way the blade is. I'm blanking right now. Let me look it up. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny because I was thinking um, uh, uh, Richard Rogers a little bit for some reason. Not yeah, a lot. A lot of people have said Rogers. In, yeah, mm -hmm. not Which necessarily I'm here. In, in terms, of, yeah, not uh, not necessarily in terms of like like the designs of the knives, but kind of how they, uh, I don't know, I don't know, something about them. I, don't, I think maybe like the functional aesthetic, I guess. Yeah, and you could really kind of see ties in with that the way he designs his knives is what I was thinking. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. You could see it in that automatic. So uh, I asked you before about design, and um, you know you mentioned coming some of your inspirations, but uh, I'd also, I'm kind of interested in uh, how you actually do it. Do you sit down with paper or, or are you always at the computer? Um, most of the time it starts just straight on the computer. I have that graphics background. So I'll start in like Adobe Illustrator just because the, the flow just works better for me in Illustrator versus like a CAD software. Um, but yeah, after I kind of sketch out stuff in Illustrator, I'll bring it over to a CAD software and make sure everything is lined up and functions correctly. And, uh, yeah, I'll flush it out there after doing the 2d. Yep. And, uh, and, and are you assimilating now, uh, what you hear from people? Um, I know you said your very first blade show. Uh, you mm -hmm. were uh, uh, when you had the Daruma. You were kind of taking in a lot of, yeah, yeah. of what people were saying. Now you know, some years into it, how do you onboard that kind of stuff? Um, I'm on. I'm still asking people for opinions all the time because you know everyone's looking for something different. But you know, if you hear one thing a ton of times, you start paying attention to it. Um, like this specifically, I was doing the uh, lock insert a specific way just because of uh, what a lot of the community has been giving me feedback on, like detent wise. So probably can't see it here, but this insert actually has the like detent ball milled into it. So it's integral to the, the steel insert. Okay. But that allows me to control like the exact height that the detent ball sits at and also allows like it to go over center slightly because if you're pressing it in, obviously it has to hold on to something oh, and you know, the width of the ball has to be some just past its center line. But if you're machining it, you can control the height however you want. And that gives this one a really like snappy crisp detent. 
God, it sounds so cool too. I mean, oh, yeah, it has that kind of ting to it too, <laughs> that people go so crazy the about. One, the only person I've uh, knife maker I've ever spoken to, I think, uh, that's done it. You uh, like you're describing is uh, Brian Nadeau. Uh, yeah, yeah. He he mills in sort of us. It it if I remember correctly, it's like kind of a kind of a wedge shape. Or yeah, something. it's like an oval like oval island that sits into like quite a big uh, detent pocket, I guess you would call it. But he also has that, he's known for that ramp that's milled oh, into yeah. the insert. Right. I think that's what he like holds a patent on or something. But uh, yeah, this one doesn't have the ramp in the insert. I'm purely using the machine detent to control the height. Yeah. The and it, feel. I, I was going to say, I bet it has a real distinct feel because uh yeah that i've only ever held one um custom uh brian nadeau and it had a, the, the oh they, they feel the, amazing yeah the release was like wow <laughs> that's i've never experienced this before so i <laughs> yeah I, I could see how doing it your way is uh um you know just leads to a different feel and the sure. control from the knife maker side is pretty unique i never thought about that uh you can't you you have to pound in a detent ball like past like at least to point. like past the center point yeah mm -hmm. yeah and so yeah. that that means to control the detent you have to deal more with the tension on the arm than with the mm -hmm. height of the 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 ball so the ball itself yeah mm -hmm. so in doing this in in making knives ha have you had a mentor or have you have you had anyone kind of show you the way at all or has this been all you you no this is just me watching like youtube videos and and looking at knives, uh, I've been pretty good at figuring out how things work just by looking at it. Um, I've been lucky in that sense. Like one of the first projects that I got as, you know, a machine shop, my friends brought in this Bonneville like salt flat racers, sequential transmission, his shifter. And they're like, hey, can you rebuild this for us? I'm like, uh, sure. <laughs> But yeah, it's this one-off sequential, and yeah, I was like making bushings and stuff for it. But yeah, I've been pretty fortunate in, you know, getting stuff to work just by looking at it. Okay, so that's what you're saying about that transmission. You'd never made one yeah. of those before, but you could look at it and and uh, like remake certain parts of it and yeah, yeah keep it functional. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, where would you be without your past automotive experience? in knife making would you would you be anywhere would you would you say that all of that has led to this in terms of uh, your abilities yeah i guess i may not be knife making at all without that initial draw into metal fabrication so yeah i, I probably owe a lot of it to that i would say i mean because uh from the outside where i'm standing mm -hmm. it's daunting you know, and you, <laughs> and you went right into making a uh, a folder, and there are only very few people that I've spoken to who have ever gone straight to folder making. And sure, and and uh, you know, um, I I I I just think it's interesting, and it's it is unique, and oftentimes it comes out of something like your situation where you mm -hmm. you have just a lot of uh, experience in another industry. Building. Sure. So we have a lot of uh, people who are in aerospace making knives, you know? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, uh, yeah, uh, pretty, pretty cool. So what are the kind of things you want to tackle as you take on more and more uh, in terms of knives? Like uh, that automatic um, was pretty damn impressive. So, yeah, I definitely want to do more automatics. Um, I'll probably attempt an OTF at some point in the near future. Uh, yeah, different mechanisms, hopefully. And uh, yeah, I might actually make a fixed blade too. <laughs> oh, going in reverse, huh? Yeah. <laughs> well, what kind? You were, you were mentioning, uh, well, Japanese culture and mm -hmm. Japanese pop culture are interesting to sure. you. Uh, how, how would you see a fixed blade knife coming out from your shop? I mean, of course, like, you know, Wakazashi or Katana would be amazing, but... Um, my first one would probably be like a collaboration with a old SWAT team friend of mine. Oh, so nice. a purely functional, like fixed blade that, uh, his team might have use for would be the first one, I think. 
I like that. That his team would have use for it. Only two uses that team would yeah. have. Uh, one is <laughs> one is busting into a door, and the other is so yeah. He says they do a bunch of hammering and cutting of uh, zip ties. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. That because yeah. that's that's what you do with a combat knife. That's the funny thing. <laughs> Open right. MREs and crates and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> uh, if 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 all if all's going right. Yeah. Well. Uh, so, right. So uh, help some of the people out who are watching, who are trying to get into knives or have recently got into, I mean, making knives. Uh, sure. Do you have any advice, anything you would tell people uh, that you've learned that might help them uh, at the onset of such a choice? Um, I guess you really have to make sure your heart's into it. Because, I mean, I was just throwing myself out there and not really expecting much. I just wanted to do it, but I think people can probably sense that there's a passion behind the work more than say like, Oh, some guy that's making a cool design, but if he's not really into it, then, uh, the person sells more than the product. I think in this industry, I would say. So in your experience of actually pressing the flesh and being at a place like Blade Show, mm -hmm. um, as uh, an, a, a relatively unknown quantity a few years ago and now growing, mm -hmm. you know, way more um, sure. known, uh, what what what's the what's the recipe for having a successful <laughs> show? Um, I think it's just being engaging as much as possible. I'm not a really outgoing person uh, in general. I'm pretty introverted. But, you know, looking people in the eye as they pass by, like greeting them, even if they're not coming up to your table, like it draws people over to look at your product and you get insights that you probably wouldn't get otherwise. So, yeah. Well, I think that's uh, pretty good advice because uh, I think a lot of people who are in the creative uh, worlds, um, mm -hmm. you know, creative industries or, or jobs yeah. are by their nature uh, more a bit introverted. Yeah. Mm -hmm, sure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you got to break that comfort zone a bit. <laughs> yeah, you do. Sure. And you know what? There, There's a, it's great on the other side. It's really nice yeah. to meet people, especially, you know, when you're at Blade Show, you're in a 100% friendly environment because uh, yeah. everyone there is interested in knives. In yeah. Blade they're all like-minded. <laughs> yeah. All yeah. a bunch of dorks. <laughs> just yeah. like you. And <laughs> no, I'm just right. kidding. Uh, I, I love it. Uh, uh, all right. Uh, Prince, man, it's been a real pleasure meeting you. Thank you for, coming on the knife junkie podcast no yeah and, it's been and great talking yeah talking about your work and, and i gotta say i i love it all but i i am most impressed and excited about the the uh the fial design uh sure. wh whether it's the crkt or the custom uh -huh. fion the fion yep the fion uh fion uh i think it's beautiful because it's useful and very different and uh it's it also shows your engineering and machining uh capabilities so yeah it's cool. definitely one of my favorites yeah well thank you very much prince it's been a pleasure yeah take care take care ever strop a knife again even though it gets no real use face up to what you are you're a knife junkie there he goes, ladies and gentlemen, Princeton Wong of Prince Customs. Uh, do sign up, uh, not sign up, but follow him on Instagram so you can uh, keep your eyes peeled for the protean drops. Uh, the knife is really cool. He he showed one uh, with the with the starburst pattern in the titanium, but he's he's made so many different ones. They are beautiful and so cool, and uh, uh, you know the the kind of custom knife you want to have for sure. Uh, all right. That does it for this episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Be sure to join us on next Sunday for another great conversation about knives with a knife person like you, me, and Prince. And then, of course, join us on Thursday for Thursday Night Knives. For Jim, working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying, until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com.
For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear Hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast.